go full tape and it matches them, that's a beautiful day. Okay? Any questions on post hole 101? Movement. Next site we're going to is the 1607 cellar, which I think they opened today, so you can get a look at it. But we're going right through those four gates. When you walk through that palisade, you're entering the triangular fort, the actual site, because all those walls around, we put those right back in the post. Right? Yeah. Why did they pick this spot with the swamp next to uh, That makes them look like they're not too smart, right? They sailed up and down this river because they, since they were under London Company orders, they had like stipulations they had to meet. So their main number one concern, their biggest fear, was attack from the Spanish. Because the Spanish had attacked French settlements on the Atlantic. So the London Company said, we're not going to settle on the Atlantic, we're going to come up river. Okay, we're coming up river off the bay far enough that you can put a uh, blockhouse guard post between you and the Atlantic for early warning systems. Okay? They knew if they had a swamp behind them and two of their corner bastions facing the river, which originally the river would have been at least 30, 40 feet further out. The erosion has pulled it back, but it was further out. If you put those bastions um, strategically placed, your large cannon facing this direction, swamp behind <coughs> you, you're protecting your settlement, okay? They also, <coughs> there was a high concentration of uh, native population in this area. That was intentional for two reasons. They wanted to trade and they wanted to Christianize, all right? Third big thing, they needed a deep water channel close to the shore. Well, some of the spots that were better to live on were fresher water with better ground to fill. The deep water channel was like out in the middle of the river. Here at Jamestown, they curved in and it was so close they could actually tie their ships up to the tree because that deep water channel was not right in and right back to that separate restaurant built right now. When it landed, it cut down to the river that made access to this island very easy. That was eroded away, but we still see remnants of that on the uh, Civil War topographical map. That fulfilled London Company regulations. So they thought when they arrived they could drink river water because the spring rains had, had pushed salt water out still and the drought that was about to happen for years and kicked in. So they could still wade out into that river, draw swords, and fish. They would, they would stick the surgeons and, and bring them to carry them in and they would feel them bumping against their legs. They'd just draw swords and that's how they were fishing. That didn't last long because that salt water kept pushing in from the bay and the sturgeon disappeared. Okay? But we find evidence of those sturgeon. Um, if you've ever seen them, they kind of look prehistoric. They have these bony plates and they, they're called scoops. We find those in this cellar. Uh, we found scoops that were about as big as my palm. And we had our sturgeon expert from BCU in Richmond come down. He even has sturgeon tattooed on his arm. Cool guy. Um, he came down with his devices and measurements and scales, and he could look at those scoops we found and say, this was a 12 foot fish. I think a lot of people. Bad little bales. Um, so we even found there's a there's a historic record. This is really cool. Don't look for this on your grocery shelf. They were making sturgeon bread. Um, and they were making sturgeon bread in these two ovens right here below. Right? There's a brick oven here, a brick oven here. This was an L-shaped cellar that would have been a structure over the top of it. It wasn't like access for everyone. Um, underneath these boards, which would be the long uh, top of the L, there are clay steps like cut into that subfloor I was talking about. Their original steps they cut in. There's even some tool marks on those. Johnson and Pocahontas, everybody that was here in those first couple of years walked down those steps into this cell. The floor level is the lowest level you see down there. Um, the rest of this high area right here, also in an L shape, hasn't been totally excavated yet. 
but this is a spot where uh, we excavated who we call James. Does anyone know that story? Okay. There had been rumors of cannibalism at Jamestown, especially the winter of 1609-1610. Governors, uh, presidents of the company are constant flux. It's about the old school where I used to uh, teach. They had a new football coach every year or two. It was kind of like here, okay? The teams up there were bad, so they like changed the coach. 80% death rate at Jamestown, you keep changing the governor, okay? You keep trying to get a new uh, council president, somebody to get things together. So there had been some reports about unspeakable things that were done during starting period. We had never found evidence of cannibalism at Jamestown until we were in this cellar. Okay? This cellar was dug in 1607. We know in 1610 it was filled in. Because one of these new governors came in and said, this place is a mess. We're going to have a massive cleanup. We're going to throw all that garbage in here and seal it up. 1610. So everything we dug in the bottom of that cellar, we know predated 1610. So we are finding evidence of the starving time. Starving time was the winter of 1609-1610 when hundreds of colonists came in, already exhausted food supplies, not much food in the port. Natives were at a time of war with them, so they could not go out to hunt or fish. They were trapped in this triangle for months. All through the winter, nothing to eat. So the candles disappeared, the dogs disappeared, the horses disappeared. We found traps in the bottom of this cellar of things that they would normally never eat. Uh, the dogs that they pushed that they would eat would be off. So we see uh, knife and hack marks on the on the front of the skulls of the dogs at the top. Horse teeth. They, they were eating everything. Okay, starvation. We were in that layer a few years ago. Uh, that food scrap layer, and we found a partial human skull. And you can see as soon as we started to uncover it, there was a top mark. Um, that was excavated, it was in more than one piece, it was disarticulated, and I'm not going to go into great detail because the children here, uh, but it was disarticulated, there was a piece of the leg bone further up into the cellar that DNA matched. The Smithsonian helped us with all this to confirm the story. If you want more of the story, um, the remains, we called her Jane. We have no idea what her name is, but we wanted to, out of respect, not just say the bones. And stuff. So uh, Jane has been recreated uh, in our museum, and there's like a wall dedicated to her. But what you can see in, in, on display is uh, the remains that we excavated put together, and then the Smithsonian did one of those CSI style recreations and the two are side by side. So it's a very poignant story and it just reminds you that Jamestown was survival. The survivor shows it on TV cracked me up because uh, you got a cameraman probably eating a Twinkie. Uh, there'd be first aid stuff there. They're not going to let those people die, correct? Here, you're thousands of miles from home. You have no backup plan. So this is true survival. And everywhere you're standing, everywhere you walk, triangle and outside of it is a mass grave. Um, over the years as we're digging we find burials every season, every summer, every year, every month, but we don't excavate those. If we did that's all we would be doing. Um, we mark them, we map them, we use our laser transits to put them on our computer grids and walk on. Okay? But we found Jane in this cellar so um, if you want more information about that you'll see it there. This was primarily used for two things. It was used for cooking and it was used for blacksmithing. Um, if I have my magnetic name badge on, which I don't, I could walk that in there, run it along that soil and iron pile and dump all over. Why would they put a blacksmith shop and a bakery in a basement? Fire. Leaches in, 
so uh, they could even tell after about a year, year and a half, the weld went bad, and then uh, they become trapped in. And that's John Smith's well, it's a beautiful track. Uh, we don't need this armor anymore, it's too hot to wear it. Uh, we don't need this helmet anymore, it's too hot. We don't need these long pole arms because we're not dismounting riders here. Um, people ask me a lot what's my favorite thing I ever found. I found one, of, they're called bill hooks. They were on the end of uh, a long pole. And then a mounted rider or knife was charging down on them. And they use that to take away from the also found where someone had been a collector. There was a small area about like my hand that the shark tooth, um, a fossilized shark's tooth, some Bermuda coral, some shells from the Atlantic coast. It's where one of these colonists was going around beachcombing, picking stuff up, you know, had his little souvenir bag and uh, probably passed away and it was just thrown into the well as trash. Um, dozens of 1601-162 Irish pennies. They were using coinage like everything else we framed up in approximate position where uh, and in a style that they would have had where they take the mud and the swamp grass and they chop that up. We tried this once. We uh, put these piles in water and clay and chopped up swamp grass and uh, went barefoot. We tried to rebuild walls. Uh, there's remnants of that on that corner. It obviously didn't work real, real well for us. So uh, when we did this, we had a little bit of concrete. Um, <laughs> no, it's not historically accurate, but it looks a lot better. Um, so anyway, this is 1608 Church. It was we know the the time frame that this was used in. So from 1608 to uh, about 1617, this was used, and then they built the church I was talking about inside that shell there. So in that time frame. Um, we knew everyone that had died that was of some importance. So, we play connect the dots, we know this is the church, and then when we find these four burials behind us, we know for sure where the front of the church is. Because in their tradition um, of the Church of England, people were buried inside the church. And most important people are right in the front. If you've been to uh, Williamsburg, that later capital, that kind of stole our thing. Um, Bruton Parish Church is loaded with people. You start up front, you work your way back, and then I guess you go outside, I don't know. Um, but when we found these four gentlemen, um, we knew we had it. So, beginning here, um, this is Reverend Hunt. He was the minister of the congregation. We had a short list of 12, 13 really important guys that died in the time frame that this was in use. So with that information, DNA, what was buried with them, we were able to determine who these people were. Reverend Hunt, he was minister of this congregation that you're sitting in right now, or leaning, looking through the window. Um, Captain Gabriel Archer, uh, John Smith's worst nightmare. And we think, you want a conspiracy theory? We think it was religious based. Because John Smith, if you know anything about the church, uh, Catholic ruler, Protestant ruler, Catholic, and they didn't like each other too much. And sometimes blood was being spilled. So at the time of King James, you've got the Church of England, and it's kind of illegal to be a Catholic, all right? Especially if you're practicing, especially if it's in the open. Captain Archer's family in England was very Catholic. He had a Catholic background. Guess what John Smith is? He is so Protestant, he's almost puritanical, all right? Do you think those people left their religion in the Atlantic on the way over here? No. You take any problems they had in England, they're now here, okay? Captain Archer dies during the starving time. And strangely enough, at his feet is a small box, a silver box called a reliquary which was traditionally Catholic because inside that silver reliquary box are saints' bones and an ampulla, which is a little uh, container for holy water. Very Catholic, placed nicely at his feet when he's buried. By the time he dies, 
the colony has gone from over 300 to a few dozen of starvation. And maybe people didn't really care what religion you were anymore because they figured they were all going to die anyway. But someone, probably a close friend of his, put that at his feet when he was buried here. Um, we find many, many small Catholic uh, medallions, saints, medals, things like that, and they're always small, and they probably had them sewn inside their, their coats. Okay, they're not wearing them out in the open. The things we find like that were probably being worn underneath clothes. We also find a lot of dice. Gambling was illegal too, and they're really small also. <coughs> He's a knight. He's sent over here to be in charge of the uh, artillery of the fort, which was fairly substantial. There were some large cannon mounted on these four, on these uh, three corners. They had ramps up to the to the top of the corners, so they could have fields of fire. Um, he was in charge of the artillery. He lived about six weeks <coughs> once he got here, because when you come to Jamestown, there's a period called the seasoning time. When, if you can make it six months, nine months, you might live a while. But there's a 70, 80% death rate within that first few months called the season. He didn't survive the seasoning time, okay? And then we have Captain uh, William West. Anyone know what a preemptive strike is? We all know what that is, right? History just is a repetition of things. Lessons learned and then forgotten and then we keep going. So. Captain William West, uh, someone, I don't know who, came up with the idea that uh, there's a major Powhatan Indian village up close to the Falls of Richmond. Um, so it's pretty powerful, so let's strike it before they hit us. It was Powhatan's elite warrior village. <laughs> Didn't go real well for the colonists. So Captain William West, who I think was around 23, 24 years old, was killed in that attack and he was brought back to be buried at Jamestown. Um, there's more on, on these burials on these two plaques. Some of the ways we've made identification on these gentlemen is fascinating. Like uh, the gentleman here had a sash across his chest and there were just a few fragments of it left, but um, it might have been Cornell that helped us with this one. But with the computer program, they were able to put that back together. So you could like see that sash reform based on the uh, threads that were remaining on his uh, on his body. All right. Question about 1608 church. Yes, sir. There's a reference over here to high lead content in the bodies. Is that the name of the computer? Yes. And the uh, better off you were, the wealthier you were, the faster you'd die from it because you had the fancy plates, not the wooden ones. Sometimes it's better to just be <laughs> down there. Yeah. Period. What were the most common things that people died of? Um, starvation, bad water. They think, um, other than the arsenic from the wells, when they were drinking this, um, they really think a lot of the symptoms were salt poisoning. Because, you know, you're thirsty, you drink that, you, you're thirstier, you keep drinking it, and it starts to shut down organs and, and gives you dementia. And some of the things they did don't seem to make a lot of sense. And if you want the conspiracy theory, they think some of the uh, Catholic colonists that were here, or Spanish spies, were spiking the common pot. They think there might be poisoning involved. We know for sure there were Spanish spies here. One was on the council, his name was George Kendall, and when they found out he was a spy, they just took him for a walk and shot him. Um, and the punishments here uh, were a little more severe, especially as a colony grew because you've got expanding, as they call them, plantations, farmsteads, and you're trying to maintain control of all that. And so some, we even see under English common law, some of the penalties here were a lot harsher than in England. So uh, there's some, some death from that. Uh, starvation was a problem for a long time. Uh, quality of food, especially with the drought, not being able to trade. And then there's a swamp with uh, mosquitoes and all the mosquito-borne illnesses you have. And they would also do things once in a while like bring plague from Europe. Um, yeah. My fiance worries about me when we excavate some of the bodies. She's like, how long can those things like viruses and bacteria live? I won't mention the strange rash I got last year for about six months and nobody could figure out what that was.
occupational hazard. Are these guys still? Um, when we were at the 1608 church just behind me was where he put his first test pit in and he hit Palisade wall right away and then it was like follow the line and he followed the line and turned and made a triangle and like he got it. That was 1994. Um, the best way to preserve it is to backfill it because like those brick ovens if we leave that exposed to the elements son to someone with money that's not going to happen there okay even like the the well-off family names if you were second third fourth son we see them coming over here because it's their shot to acquire land if you can't afford passage over here to even try you know what you do you indenture yourself you, you sell yourself into seven years of service for your passage and there are cases of that. They survive the seasoning time. They survive that seven years. At the end of seven years, they're given land. Um, one record I read, they were given armor and weapons and something to break the ground up with. And they were taken care of if you survived it. The people that were survived came to be known and called ancient planters. Ancient as in they made it. You know, it might be five, 10 years before, but you made it. Um, so there were a few that did that, and if there's a few, that, that holds out hope, right? So people have a chance. And when we actually went back and looked at some of the life expectancies in the towns like London, it wasn't that much better. You had open sewers that you were you know, throwing garbage out, and the Thames River was a mess, and you know, life expectancy wasn't necessarily that much better in a city like that. The plague and the, yeah, all of that factored in. Um, some of these men were just curious. Um, when I grew up, we had a big 60 acre woods behind my house. Mom couldn't keep me out of there. She tried, but I, I wanted to know what was there. You know, it's just natural curiosity. You ever just go down a road, you don't, you just, my, my mom and dad used to call them goose chases, where you just take off and you just see where you end up. You take a picnic basket with you. That's like, that's the same mentality. I mean, it's, it's ramped up here. It's on hormones, but it's the same mentality. What's across the Atlantic? The people had those visions. They knew the Spanish had found gold. So in this first expedition, there were a small group of men assigned to look for precious, uh, precious metal. Okay, but they also had carpenters. They had miners. The gentlemen of the time, as they were called, could hunt and fish and ride. It's not like they weren't outdoorsy kind of guys. Um, so when they arrive here, you've got this, all, this, this mix. 
okay, with, with different jobs to do. Some people are trying to figure out how to make money here with different experiments. You got this mix. But you also have uh, natives around that aren't real happy to see them right then. So they're attacked within a short period of time after they are on this island. And they've tried to fortify a little bit by putting brush around them, and around their tents. That's not going to work real well. And they're attacked. We found um, one body on the other side of that palisade where there's a white triangular arrow point next to the back of the leg where it hit and stuck. And both shoulders are crushed about 14, 15 year old boy. That's evidence of what was happening when they got here, all right? So now they have to build this fort. These men have laid at anchor too long in England. Ships are not healthy places to be either. So they're already weakened from that. Bad food, bad water across the Atlantic, long voyage. You hit here in the hot summer, armor, quilted clothing, wool, total culture change. Trees are unfamiliar to them. A lot of the animals here are unfamiliar. Climate's different. They just, the water, you're drinking that out of the river. So, now you have to build a fort. You're already dead tired. You're worn out. You're scared. And you have to build a fort. In less than two weeks, they put up a palisade where they cut down hundreds of trees, trimmed them into thirds, dug a moat ditch out in front, put those in, pack them in, sharpen those, trim them up, cut down all the trees around so they could see if anyone was sneaking up on them. It took them less than two weeks to do it. And then as soon as that's built, they start to die. It's That's like the straw. You know, that's taking the last of them. And they start dying every day. And they're keeping a record of who dies this day, the two that die the next day, the three that die the next day. That field there, you, you can go in there and read the names of the first men. It's on a wall as you go in, the first uh, folks that came here. Those are the ones that are buried there. Okay, and they came from all walks of life, some from ship's boys to gentlemen. Okay, that's where they are. Um, a few years, well actually it was 2008, we were cleaning up that burial field for photographs, not excavating the, the bodies, but just cleaning it up to make photographs. We didn't have drones in, so we had to get the cherry picker trucks in, okay. rent one of those, and like go up in those and make photos. Now we just fly drones over. It's great. <laughs> um, but we were cleaning all those up just for the photography. And I'll never forget it. You know you have certain moments in life where you just like something just clicks. I was like on my hands and knees troweling, you know, scoring around the, uh, the rectangle because it's like the post holes. You can see the mottled ground and it's in a rectangle, so that's the burial shaft. You're cleaning those up. So I'm knees down, hands down, and I'm thinking. This is when it became real to me, because it's like, who are you? What did you look like? How tall were you? Why did you do this? Why did you come here? Did you have a girlfriend back in England? What did your mom and dad think about this? <laughs> because most of these guys were fairly young. Some of the older leaders were in their 30s, but you're talking, most of these guys are in their 20s, okay? And it just, there was like a connect there, like, you were just as alive as me, you're like a foot below me, and you, the stories you could tell, you know, we could talk to you right now. That humanized it for me, and that has never gone away. So when I find a piece of plaster from the church that stood there in 1619, and that plaster has whitewash on it and a fingerprint and a beard hair embedded in the in the uh, whitewash that's somebody um, when they would make brick and they would put the wet clay into molds and set them out if they pick them up too soon guess what they leave fingerprints or even whole hand prints so we'll find a brick that you can literally you know put your fingers right back into that spot that that to me is what makes my job so much fun because you're uncovering a story. You're not rewriting history, you're writing. And the project we're out on right now where we're trying to find the site where the first named English slave in America worked, you know, it's it's like that that's not known yet. And I'm fortunate because I get a chance to help uncover that, share that with everybody. <laughs> I 
I get rolling. I, <laughs> I, I haven't done this this much, so. That's awesome. Oh, thanks.